Good afternoon, everyone. I'd like to go ahead and call this meeting to order. Uh, the first item on the agenda is the invocation. Loving and gracious God, you are indeed the giver of all good gifts, and we thank you uh, today for all your blessings, for the successful outcomes of our school events, and for our, all of our staff members. We ask that you bless them abundantly, and we continue to seek your wisdom, guidance, courage, and strength. Be with us in our deliberations, and help us to be wise in the decisions we make for the good of all who have placed their trust and confidence in us. Give us insight and lead us and give us insight to lead with integrity that our decisions may reflect what is right and good. Keep us from short-sightedness and pettiness. Help us to make decisions that are good for the good of all and guard us from blind self-interest. Dear Lord, grant us uh, with the humility to always seek your will in all that we do and say. Amen. Thank you. Uh, next item on the agenda is our Pledge of Allegiance, and that is led by Boy Scout Troop 575 and Scout Pack 574. We've got a pack of one. <laughs> please, please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, sir. Next item on the uh, agenda is to adopt the agenda. I need a motion. I have a motion by Mr. Drexler. I have a second by Mr. Fuller. Any discussion? All those in favor? Motion carries 6-0. Uh, next item on the agenda is the approval of the uh, minutes from our July 10th meeting. I have a motion by Colonel Hills. I have a second by Ms. Owens. Any discussion? All those in favor? Motion carries unanimously. Moving right along. Next item on the uh, agenda is uh, important dates, and we've got a couple. <clears throat> Yesterday, Davie County Early College started, first day of school. It's amazing uh, that we are here. Um, August 24th, uh, it's always a great event at 8.30 a.m. It's the Davie County School Convocation at the Davie County High School. We always look forward to that. And the dreaded August 27th is uh, the first day of school. Didn't mean to say that out loud. Uh, first day of school is the 27th. Looking forward to a great year. Uh, it's a lot of preparation over the summer. Uh, we will never know, those that don't do it, <laughs> will never know the amount of preparation and everything that goes into making a successful year uh, that doesn't just happen when the kids are there. So thank you for all of those things that happen and the people that make it happen. Uh, and then uh, we're in here September 4th for our next uh, board meeting, and that is starting at 6 o'clock. Correct. Starting our regular schedule. Next item on the agenda is, uh, sir. I've got September 4th. Yes. That's Board of Commissioners. I'm sorry. Highlighted the wrong thing. Thank you. September 11th. Board of Education meeting, and that starts at 515. Sorry, and we're starting with closed session. Thank you, sir. <laughs> we'll change your plan. No. September 11th, 515, closed session. So we start with our uh, regular schedule. Thank you for that. Now, uh, next item on the agenda is the superintendent's report, and I'll turn it over to Dr. Hartness. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good evening, everyone. It's a uh, Good to see everybody out. Hope everyone is having a nice summer that is almost over. As Chairman Rip mentioned, we uh, started our first day with early college high school students yesterday. Um, Ms. Absher and the team at Davie Early College High School are off to a great start. I had the pleasure of walking through their freshman orientation yesterday, and they're all getting acclimated to their new home in high school. Um, our beginning teachers will be here next week. Ms. Haynes and Mr. Wallace and several of our staff will be beginning teacher orientation, leading that next week. Our other teachers will return on the 20th, and August 27th is a day that we celebrate, and I know there's a lot of parents in the community who will celebrate on August 27th. That will be our first official day for our students on a traditional calendar. So summer is almost over. 
we're in the swing of things. Um, at our meeting this afternoon, we're going to spend a little bit of time going over um, what has brought us to the development of our new strategic plan, so we'll spend some time with that. Otherwise, it's going to be a fairly short meeting, but get ready and hang on. Till we have lots of staff reports for you in the month of September as we recap uh, summer activities. We talk to you about what's in store for the fall. We adopt a budget, and um, we'll, we'll be ready for that. I do have a couple of great pieces of information to share with you today, though. Um, the school resource officer grant that we applied for. Um, that grant was originally scheduled to be awarded in April, but there were some delays in Raleigh. But we were notified over the weekend that uh, we have been awarded that grant of $66,000. So we will be working with our sheriff and the county commissioners to get those positions in place as soon as we can. Last year, Davie County Schools was, was the recipient of a $50,000 digital learning planning grant. Our curriculum department, um, John Marshall, several of our staff have worked really hard on that planning grant to implement digital learning in our middle schools. We were notified this summer that we have now received an implementation grant of $150,000 over the next two years. So that will be a nice boost for our technology and instructional technology program. And tonight on your agenda, we have um, more information. You have a contract to consider in the consent agenda for our student-run credit union. We are real excited about kicking that off at Davie High School and having that experience for our students this fall. So with that, Mr. Chairman, I'm going to turn it back to you. I'll come back to talk about strategic planning in a few minutes. Great. Where is that, uh, orientation here? Orientation is at South Davie, is that right? South at the Media Center. Okay. Thank you. Uh, next item on the agenda is recognition. And uh, we have the Northwest, Northwest Regional Instructional Management Coordinator of the Year. And the presenter is Anthony Davis. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, Dr. Hartness, members of the board, uh, guests. Um, it thrills me, honestly, to be able to recognize Ms. Darla Goldfuss uh, for her accomplishment. Um, you know, if you read what it says in an, in an IMC and what her job is, she does so much more than that. I mean, her job description is coordinating uh, assessments for CTE um, and, and going through and making sure the data collection is there, which is, is so important to the things that I do and things that I have to turn into the state. And if Darla's uh, information was not correct, then our information to the state wouldn't be correct and we wouldn't get our money. So it's very, very important what she does. And, and not listed in her title is training a new CTE director director, which she has done a phenomenal job in that as well. Um, I greatly appreciate uh, uh, what she has done for me uh, personally in bringing me in this role as well, and it doesn't really have to do with this, but also with Driver's Ed. She's been very helpful with that as well. Uh, but Darla does a great job. Uh, she's always accessible. I've, I've, you know, I call her, you know, uh, email her. She's just responding right back with everything. And, and not only do we recognize what great things she has done but her peers in the Northwest region, which is now the Piedmont region, uh, also recognized that. And so she was recognized this just uh, a few weeks ago at our summer uh, conference as the uh, Northwest Regional uh, IMC. So Darla, we thank you for everything that you have done and thank you for everything that you continue to do and we appreciate what, you, what you've done for CTE. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you and congratulations. Uh, next item on the agenda is a consent agenda and I will entertain a motion. I have a motion by Mr. Drexler, I have a second. Second by Ms. Owens, any discussion? All those in favor? Motion carries 6-0. Thank you very much. Uh, next item on the agenda is the uh, Davie County School Strategic Plan and turn it over to Dr. Hartness. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm going to ask if you would take one of those and pass it around. We'll give Ms. Wilson one as well. You. While you're passing this around, board, you also notice that there's a book at your table. Some of you have already been by the office and picked up your copy. This is a book, the title is Spark. It's written by uh, three professionals who are doing leadership consulting, all of which have been um, in the military. And they share a lot of their military experiences and correlate those experiences to leadership principles. We felt like as a staff this would be a great follow-up to our last book study. 
we're always trying to grow and develop as leaders and working together through our leadership team. All of our principals, assistant principals, and administrators uh, typically are reading a book together and doing a book study together each year. So this is our book study for the year, and we wanted you to have a copy so that you can um, be exposed to the same thing our administrators are exposed to. Absolutely. Uh, if technology team can switch over to my computer, we're going to talk strategic planning. Um, board, you don't have this presentation uh, uploaded to Board Docs. It's very large. Um, the file size is very large. But what we wanted to do tonight is not only share with you the strategic plan for 2018 through 2023, but talk to you about how we got here. Um, I want to thank uh, Mr. Junker and Ms. Horn for serving on our strategic planning steering committee. So, Mr. Junker, if you will bear with me, you're going to see a lot of slides you've seen before. But we wanted to provide you the same slide deck that we provided our steering committee when we first began this work uh, back in February. And this slide deck is really an overview of the accomplishments and things that we have accomplished through our last five-year strategic planning process. Um, I'll provide you a copy of this, but this just really gives you an idea, an overview of where we've been as a district, and I think it will really lay the groundwork for what you're going to see when you review our current goals and strategies for where we go next as an organization and as a district. So what we've decided to do is Ms. Haynes and I are going to tag team uh, on this presentation and go, th go through the accomplishments from 2013 to 17 that led us to this plan, and then we will go through and highlight the, the components of this new plan. So this has been our vision for the past five years. We'll be a national model in creating educational excellence through innovative and personalized experiences. Our last strategic planning steering committee and, and the group came up with this vision. So this is what's guided our work the last five years. I will tell you, I have a lot of slides. And I'm not going to go into detail on every one of them. So don't think I'm flying through, but we would be here a long time if we spent a lot of time on every one of these. This is the mission that we have been working under the last five years. Uh, we'll spark curiosity and passion for learning, promote individual excellence, challenge students to accept personal responsibility as citizens in a diverse community. The district will create safe, world-class learning environments facilitated by highly effective faculty and staff. We will invite collaboration through intentional partnerships with the community and beyond and opening the doors to a global perspective for our students. The committee narrowed down and selected these core beliefs and values to guide our work. So that was the, the essence of the guiding principles in the last strategic plan. And we had a number of goals and strategies and action steps within that plan that led us to where we are today. And that plan is up on our website for anyone to review and has been for the last five years. What we want to do now is kind of give you an overview of some data about the district. We're going to talk about population and demographics. We're going to talk about academic performance. Now, I will go ahead and tell you that there's no way that Jenda and I can present academic performance like Aaron Foyle. Aaron will be back in September, I believe, doing a real deep dive overview of our last year's performance. But we have some statistical data over several years that we want to show you. Start with population and demographics. How has our district changed in the last five years? This is a chart that shows overall enrollment in our elementary schools. We've seen a 6.8% decrease in enrollment since 2012. And uh, you can see, especially in this area right here, you'll notice some changes, a big decline in enrollment at Moxville Elementary School. This is the year that we did redistricting to alleviate some overcrowding at Moxville. You can see how that they have um, stayed pretty steady and they're still our largest elementary school. And you can see how the population has fluctuated at our other schools as well. Middle school, we've seen uh, some fluctuation. South Davy remains our largest middle school with about 553 students at the end of 1718. And North Davy as our smallest school. We saw about a 7% decrease in enrollment over five years at those three schools. As far as high school enrollment, it's been remained pretty steady. We saw um, 
a 0.57% decrease in enrollment in our high school population over that five-year period of time. The early college is right around 170 students, and um, that's where that, that college will remain. That's about the number of students we select at the beginning of each year is around 45, and that keeps that cohort about that size, um, which is the right size for that size campus. So population demographics overall, we've had a 5% decrease in enrollment since 2012. We were right at 61.44 for 2017-18. I shared this because uh, this is an estimate. The North Carolina Division of Non-Public Education estimates that there are 736 students in Davie County who are homeschooled. And we have a lot of transition between homeschools, both leaving the school district to be homeschooled and then coming back from homeschool. So we're paying attention to this demographic and these students because we consider them all of our students. They're citizens of Davie County. But this is right in line with the trend that we've seen across the state. If you combine all the homeschool students in North Carolina, it would be the third largest school district in the state. There's over 100,000 homeschool students now. That is estimated because there's no accurate count. There's very little accountability um, in tracking the number of students being served in an individual homeschool once they, they register with the Division of Non-Public Education. Sure. If, if a, maybe this is obvious. If a student's enrolled in our public system and they choose to go to homeschool, they have to withdraw so you know that they're going somewhere, but you're not necessarily going to know wh whether they go to another system, different school so, system, or homeschool. Is that correct? So if a student, and Aaron is our expert on the whole enrollment and withdrawal process, but if a student withdraws, um, we will look for a records request from another school district, or they will have to present evidence that they have established a homeschool for them to meet compulsory attendance law. Population demographics, how has that changed from 2012 to 2017-18? Um, um, you can see at this, this, these two pie charts, our Hispanic population has grown by 2%. Our black population has grown by 1%. Multiracial has grown by um, 1%. And the number or percentage of white students has decreased by 4%. So when you look at the strategic priorities, there were six in our last strategic plan, and you can see those six listed there. So we're going to hit each of these strategic priorities and, and show you some things that were accomplished in each area. So Ms. Haynes, I'm going to kick it over to you for world-class teaching and learning. Okay, again, we're, we're going to give you really an overview, a bird's eye view of some of the information related to teaching and learning, not the deep dive that Aaron will provide later. Um, if we look back over the last five years, this slide shows you our graduation rate. Um, and basically, we've increased from that 83.2% to the 87.3% with a little fluctuation in between. But you can see that we're, we are staying above the state average, still with our goal being to hit that 90%. So we're close. Ms. Haynes, if I could also point out, if you look at the bottom of that graph, the four-year cohort graduation rate for the UNC system in North Carolina is 38.8%. And after six years, those enrolled in a four-year program in our university system, the graduation rate is 60.2%. So I think that's um, just an interesting set of data to keep in mind. So Aaron tracks some of students' post-graduation information. Um, this is self-reporting, but you will see here the percentage of students enrolled in college this semester immediately after they graduate. Um, with 2017, our most recent data being at 62%, but staying in that, in the um, 60 to 60, 60 to 70 percentile, generally speaking. Um, this does not consider students who take some time off and, and go back um, after that first semester. Here, if you look at our ACT proficiency, you can see again that we consistently rank higher than the state um, from 2013 to 2017. And you'll notice, again, our most recent data in 2017, 68% of our students meet the University, of, the University of North Carolina system's minimum requirements for admission to college. That's pretty impressive. I'd like to point out something here as well. So when you look at 2017, 68% 
of our juniors, because they take the ACT at the end of their junior year, 68% are meeting the minimum requirements to go to a university in North Carolina. When we go back one slide, only 62% are immediately enrolled in a college the fall semester after graduation. That's an area that we want to see increase. It's obvious that our students are well prepared at the end of their junior year. We don't know what the data is at the end of the senior year because they take the ACT in their junior year. But only 62% of our children are going to college, which is similar to the demographics of students in areas that are similar to ours. We actually have a contract with the National Student Clearinghouse that tells us where our cohorts of students are in their college experience. So we have, we're tracking that data to see where they are going to college and how many are staying after the first year, second, and third. Uh, okay, with regard to that number right there and what we're talking about, what are we doing to, to get to, to, to existing students within our school system that did meet that percentage that they were eligible to apply to any state supporting school in North Carolina. What are we doing to identify those kids and to try to solicit their support and, and guidance and, and scholarships and so forth uh, as far as to going into those universities? Jenny can pick up on this too, but this is, that's a counseling function Absolutely. of the school. And um, you know we have strong folks in our career and technical education program that are counseling students. We actually have a part-time counseling coach from the community college system that spends time on campus now helping students in, to, to realize what the opportunities are after high school. But that's a partnership between the school system and parents. So Jenny, you can add to that if you'd like. I would just speak that since, since your retirement, Colonel, um, student services has really prioritized personalized meetings with students and parents if, if they're interested as well. But um, that one-on-one -on -one annual, at least annual meeting with students is, is really critical. Um, as he mentioned, we have a part-time career coach, which is funded through a, a grant opportunity with DCCC. We just learned that that person has, has made a significant impact in our career and college promise rate. Um, and they're actually going to increase that from part-time to full-time this year. So that will give us another another support person at Davie High School, or another half of a person, so to speak, yeah. um, to continue focusing on that coaching of students. Because we realize that, in, in unfortunately, too many cases, their parents aren't aren't prepared to give the kids really serious guidance based on knowledge, because they don't have that education themselves. So you find the student who, you know, when really asked, would like to go and say they would like to go, but it never materializes. So we've got to, we have a great opportunity here to pick up on that shortcoming and increase those number of students getting into a, an institution. The thing I would also mention is um, that, that communication and partnership with parents is important. I mean, the, what, what students do after high school is a family decision. It's a decision. What we want to do is expose them as much as possible to the possibilities. Yes. Uh, the things that we've done this past year with our STEM tours to businesses, and we'll talk about that later in this presentation, is exposing students to what opportunities are available in our community. Right. Um, there are a lot of wonderful paying jobs that you can explore and can be prepared for with certifications or a two-year degree. So the four-year track is not for every student. Oh, I understand. But I think what is impressive and the board should be proud of is that our students have the option. The academic preparation to get into a university when 68% of your students are proficient in the ACT to meet those minimum standards in March of their junior year the school district is preparing our students to have that option if they choose. That's exactly right. So and you know, a there's, there's a lot of scholarship money out there. Over the summer, I had the pleasure of presenting a four-year scholarship to a, a student. And as part of the North Carolina Division of Veterans Administration, we give scholarships each year to dependents of veterans. And we've been in the Middle East now for 17 years. So those kids that go into those high schools have grown up in that environment. So what I'm saying is, We've got a lot of parents that are, in fact, veterans. We've got a website that they can go to, and just recently they can fill everything out online, all the required documentation and so forth. And then they're, they're evaluated based on a group that we have, a committee, and then put before the, the commissioners that serve on that board to award scholarships. This past year we awarded 376, I think, scholarships 
to kids here in North Carolina that are their moms or dads are veterans. So, you know, that's just one of the many opportunities for th that we have on wearing another hat to provide those education to those kids. And I hope, and, and I'll be checking in the future as I have in the past, to make sure that the guidance department is fully aware of that and can, can show them how to get access. And to we're going to provide you some data in a few minutes on the number of scholarships that our students have received. Oh, yeah. Oh, so. yeah. I'm aware. Thank you. Okay, this next slide is just looking at the ACT scores a little, just a, a different perspective here. This is showing you um, the average AC, ACT score, so you can see um, our climb to 20.5 and then 20 in 2017 in comparison to that state average. Um, again, a composite score of 17 is that minimum requirement that the University of North Carolina system is looking for um, to indicate that students are prepared for college. So we're significantly above that 17 in our average. This slide gives you um, the historical perspective on SAT scores, um, it, not only in comparison to the state, but also the national average. So if you look at the orange bar in comparison to the, the gray and the white, you can see our SAT scores continue to climb, and it's something that we're very proud of. ACT work keys um, are really associated, this is testing that's associated with CTE students, um, those who are going through career and technical education, and they're concentrators. So they've taken multiple levels um, within a CTE pathway. And within the, a the ACT work keys, there are three subtests, and we're still looking at math and reading, but in more of an application base. And again, you can see um, strong scores, particularly in comparison to the state average. Our CTE students do extremely well. So it's a great night for Darla to be here. The next several slides um, show you our proficiency levels in reading, math, and science across third through eighth grades. In each case, you're looking at an orange bar compared to the gray, which is the state average. And again, you're going to see across the board, we're staying above the state average. These stronger areas than others, um, but again, consistently as you scroll through these slides, consistently above the state average. You know, it's interesting, yeah, it's interesting that you point that out because, again, you see that same pattern across the state. Um, so that's certainly something that you know, could be related to eighth grade, could be related to curriculum, um, could be related to age group. Um, there are lots of variables there that, that could impact that. Um, but it is a trend that we typically see, a drop in eighth grade. True. That eighth grade class, a different group of students in seventh, so we're not looking at it longitudinally. Right. You're not tracking longitudinally here. This slide, I want to explain a little bit. Um, I think you've heard Dr. Hartness speak about this before, but this helps understand proficiency rates a little bit better. Um, typically speaking, and, and when I say typically, if we look at research, if we look at historical data, and that's what we're looking at here from 2002 to 2017, um, with our district information in orange versus the state in, the, in white. If you track across this from left to right, you'll see a big dip, and then you see the bar climb back up and kind of plateau, and then you see a big dip. Um, what happens is when the state introduces new curriculum, new standards, um, there's an implementation dip. So once, that, once the new curriculum is introduced, we have new testing that follows. So we see scores that really drop, and that's the drop that you see in 2008. Then as we adjust and we learn those curriculum standards, we get better at teaching them. You'll see the scores increase. You see that they kind of plateau, and then they introduce new standards, and you see a dip again. It just so happens that we are also introducing new standards in reading uh, or in English language arts and math this coming year. So we will have new math tests at the end of this year, new um, ELA test at the end of next year. But this is the kind of pattern that we see. Um, 
But you also should look at, if you look between 2002 and 2008 versus 2013 to 2017, um, look at the significant difference in proficiency rates and how not only the curriculum and standard expectations have changed, but also how assessments have changed. I would just point out, too, um, as we look at these earlier grades, you'll see lower proficiency rates. You look at our outcomes, like ACT and SAT, before students exit high school, we're making progress as a district. But this, I think this 15-year snapshot says a lot because we have people question, well, why are only 50% of your students proficient? Which is a great question. And you look over time, if I look at from 2002 to 2007, we had between 80 and 90% of our students who were proficient according to that set of standards, according to those cut scores, according to those assessments. When new assessments are introduced, we saw a huge dip the next year. We saw an increase over the next five years. Then we saw another huge dip. And the mystery for all of us is across the last five years, as a state and as a district, we haven't seen the increase that we've seen in the past. And what I would remind the board is the things that we're requiring third, fourth, and fifth graders to do are several grade levels higher now than they were over here. And I think that's important for us to remember too, um, that our, where they were these first five years, our expectations are much higher for those students. The things they're doing in third grade now, their reading levels and expectations in third grade are what we used to expect in fifth and sixth grade. Sometimes we question whether or not those things are developmentally appropriate. So, but, but, but those are, high, those are high standards, and we have to recognize they're high standards, and we have to strive to meet those standards. But I want you to understand that they're different standards. And when, when the state sets cut scores, that determines proficiency ratings across the state. We have to, to challenge ourselves to meet those. But that gives you an idea. I don't believe our students in third through eighth grade in these first five years are better prepared for life than our third through fifth, third through eighth graders in this last five years on the chart. They're just tested on different standards and with different assessments. Mr. Drexler. You said this before, but I want to go back and, and get you to say something. From far left to far right, there's three segments in there that stand out. In the first seg segment, at Davies, I'm having trouble with these numbers. Is that 84.5 yes. to 89.5? Correct. Seems to me that's five points. And then it, in the middle section from 2008, it went from, is that a 63 yep. to an 82? That's almost 20 points. You'll see the same trend line with the state. And then, yes, and then the final segment, 13 to 17, it says 50.2 to 50.0. And this is what you said before, but I need some more information. In the, in the first segment, the state average and the Davy average pretty much parallel growth. In the middle segment, the state increases and Davy increases pretty much equally. In the final segment, Davies goes down until the last 17 year and the state comes up progressively, but it was a little down in the year 17 as well. What, what have your curriculum folks, and maybe this is a better question for Aaron, what have we learned in the past few years that the orange line decreases in 17 from year 2013? Jenna, do you have any comments I'm, I'm there? I mean, I'm maybe you, you have described people. what the data set looks like here. There has a you know, performance for across the state and in Davie County Schools has been fairly flat over the last five years. Jenna, when you talk to uh, our instructional coaches and our teachers, what feedback do you get um, from them related to these assessment and data? 
Of course, we're, we're always looking at information, um, in some cases tracking cohorts of students over time um, and trying to, trying to really see some kind of trend or trying to, trying to figure out what it is that we need to do to change. Um, our focus more recently has been just trying to make sure that we are completely aligned with the standards and that we are teaching to the standards and, and that, the, that what we're teaching is aligned with what they're, how they're being assessed, what they're being assessed and how they're being assessed. Um, but it's, it's a constant struggle. Well, I think if you think back, um, I know that uh, you guys have played a big part in uh, going back and talking to the folks at DPI in how, how the assessment, I guess the, the standard versus what you're teaching. I mean, it, it, the, the issue, I know you believed um, when the renorming happened that there was an issue with the standards were set too high basically, or the way that they were scoring testing was, there was an issue with that. Um, so, and I know we've had some of those discussions here. Um, uh, I remember that. So, um, and, and it, you know, but it's, um, I don't know, I guess, you, I guess you always have to update and change, but it's, it's hard if, when that happens, if, if DPI doesn't have their uh, ducks in a row so that you know what you're teaching against what standard that's that's it's hard to reset you you just can't make that happen overnight that's and, we, and we do have to look at cohorts of students there are sure. cohorts there are classes um, just even at the high school as we see those cohorts come through there are classes that are stronger there are classes right. that are more competitive um, and then there are classes that are not as strong academically and so trying to figure out how to meet their needs is always the teacher's challenge right different group every year and I think what we got to, to to remember is education is a process and students meet goals at different times in their educational career and it is it's difficult for me as a superintendent to sit here and say 50 percent proficiency is okay that's not okay and I'm not making excuses and I'm not going to make excuses but when I look at our end results of where we end up with our ACT and our SAT and how we compare nationally there's a big disconnect between those types of assessments and the, the state assessments that are developed here in the state of North Carolina. Uh, the other thing that's very different, I had a conversation with my, one of my colleagues in Massachusetts. Massachusetts is one of the highest performing school districts in America, uh, states in America. One of the things that's very different is every year, teachers are provided released test items so that they can see what students are being assessed on. I think the last time our teachers were provided assessments that were released items was 2013. So, uh, so you know, our, the, the state assessment is still a very big mystery in North Carolina. Yeah, and I think that was, that was the point I'm making. Is 50% profi proficiency really 50% proficiency? I mean, I understand it is against the standard, but how does the standard weigh against what the material is that they're expecting to learn? That's That's the... That's the problem, Paul, and I, I think it's, um, you know, and, and it's always, you know, looking at yourself, and, and this is very helpful, looking at yourself against what everybody else is doing is, is helpful. But to Paul's point, I think yeah. that we've got to be aware of, okay, if our trend is we're trending above the state average, right. we don't want that trend to be closer to the state That's average. Right. We want to con continue that positive trend right. forward. Comparatively, those three, three segments that are identified there, the ACT and SAT over the same period of time, the, our, our testing, the end result of ACT and SAT doesn't come close to reflecting what that's showing. Am, am I correct? Correct. Correct. I'm going to turn off my little button and shut. <laughs> you know, I would, sitting here and listening to all this, and looking how we, in many cases, exceed the state standards, who is talking to DPI? Who, you know, if I'm part of the state of North Carolina or, or responsible for this, then I, as a state, I'm certainly concerned at where we are with regard to other, other states, like the one you mentioned. What are we doing? What are we not doing that we should be doing? Uh, and so I would be looking for answers 
along that line as a county. I think we need to. And if, if North Carolina says, well, you know what, we don't know, we need to find out. You definitely need to find out so we can get on the bandwagon. And I'll, and I'll, I'll brag on Dr. Hartness. When, when that renorming happened, he spent a bunch of time with folks at DPI in Raleigh about what's going on. This doesn't make any sense. You guys need to figure this out. I mean, I, that, that did happen. It was, it was a lot of time poured into that. Unfortunately, I can't say how effective I was in reaching that concern. All right, this slide is sort of a continuation from that last slide, but in this case, we're looking specifically at third grade reading and grade level proficiency versus the CCR. So we're looking at students um, who are threes, fours, and fives in this case, not just the fours and fives over the last five years. So then we go on and look at math from grades three through eight. And you'll also have a slide on science. Again, you will continue to see the trend of the orange bar over the gray bar that we're staying above the state average, never as high as we want to be, but always higher than the state, which is, we do want to maintain. And then this is the high school proficiency. Note that for the high school, unfortunately, there are only three, um, three real data points, math one, biology, and English two. Um, there are many other NC final exams, many other, many other testing um, opportunities, but these are the only three that are included as far as high school proficiency. And this is a sheet that you have seen or a slide that you've seen multiple times. Um, you're familiar with this from some of Erin's reporting, and she will be providing, again, some additional information um, related to this past school year coming up in September. This slide just gives you a sampling of many curricular and extracurricular awards. Um, test scores are important, but they're not everything. Um, so as you can see on this slide, there are lots of things that we, we should be proud of in Davie County. CTE is right there in the center. In 2015-16, ranked number one in North Carolina. Um, in 16-17, the sixth highest as far as reaching um, creden credentials. Um, a Clarion Award that, that is quite impressive. Our marching band going to Chicago. Um, lots of things, again, for us to be proud of in Davie County. All right, also, highly effective and inspired educators and staff. They, one of our other priority areas. Um, you will see that we were voted best place to work in Davie County, which is something we were quite proud of in 2016. This slide shows our teacher turnover rate in 2017 in comparison um, to North Carolina. And again, highlighting some awards, um, some special recognitions from many of our highly effective staff. Next, we move to enhanced educational environment. That was another strategic priority. And a big part of the last strategic plan was addressing our facility needs and aligning our processes and procedures to the facilities assessment that we had invested in uh, a number of years ago and um, that resulted in our new high school so we're real proud of that and this past year has been a phenomenal year at Davie High School it, we've had a ton of visitors we have a number of events scheduled this fall for people to come and visit uh, our school we feel like it's definitely a model high school for in the state of North Carolina also, I'm real proud of the, the STEM Center at Davie High and the hard work from our curriculum department. They were a STEM school of distinction in 2016 and recognized at the state level. We are blessed with a number of outside private sources of funding to support successful ventures in the district. Um, Ashley Furniture, you know, is one of our partners for Art Smart each year. We've uh, as I mentioned earlier tonight, the $50,000 planning grant that led to a $150,000 implementation grant. We've had a $200,000 grant from the Golden Leaf Foundation. Ingersoll Rand has been a great partner. We have a lot of businesses involved in supporting robotics, and we mentioned earlier the successful redistricting in 2013. 
community business and higher education collaboration. Jen, do you wanna take this one? Sure. Um, last year we had our very first manufacturing day last fall. Um, this was really a partnership um, with our, our local businesses as well as the Chamber of Commerce and our local workforce development. Um, all of our eighth graders visited multiple sites and were able to really get out there and see some of the opportunities in Davie County, um, better understand what kind of education is required, what kind of salaries are available and those sorts of things, but to really get them thinking, um, as we were talking about earlier, thinking about their future um, and what kind of career path they might be interested in. So that was, that was a great partnership and something that, that Anthony will continue to, to spearhead this, this year. We can't say enough about our partnership with the Mebbin Foundation. Um, what a blessing. Um, Jennifer Line and Peggy, Peggy Knuckles um, have been instrumental in leading the way with the Davy Leeds Initiative. Um, and we are, we are just completely blessed with the Mebbin Foundation and the support, not only for our Read to Achieve summer camps, but with the Davy Leeds Initiative and, and um, the progress we hope to make with that initiative. I think it'll be important to, to note, too, when we look at our new strategic plan, several of the goals that are part of our Davy Leeds project are embedded into our strategic plan. And as you know, the Davy Community Foundation is also a tremendous partner and supporter. Um, if you look across from the Healthy Davy Initiative to grants, um, not only for camps, but also for scholarships for students, another tremendous blessing um, as far as the support that we see within our community. And this is sort of a splash of various partners across the county um, who support Davie County Schools and make a difference in what we do on a daily basis. Parent engagement was another priority. As you can see, sort of a word splash here um, lots of strategies and action steps in engaging parents in the last five years of this most recent strategic plan. And then another strategic priority that was really important to us in the last plan was our communication and public relationships. Um, you'll see that there's been a number of things that we put in place over the last several years to increase communication about our schools to the community. And uh, that, that everything from our branding to, and marketing through our communications department, the things that you've done with board docs and making your agendas and your meetings and minutes and the video of these meetings accessible online and on the local television station um, has been uh, an increase in transparency and communication about what the schools are doing in the community. Uh, School Matters, our electronic newsletter that goes out to thousands of people. We have utilized what used to be ConnectEd and School Messenger very effectively. We're using social media, Facebook, Twitter, and um, I think a lot of that has to do with um, how we have uh, improved education in Davie, and I believe it's a great place to work and learn, and that's why we were chosen as the best place to work in Davie County by the Chamber. So what we've done is given you um, a set of slide, a slide deck that we presented to the Strategic Planning Steering Committee and said, okay, you have a copy of our old strategic plan for the past five years. Here's the things we've accomplished. We decided, you know, what are the things that have worked that we want to make sure stay in the plan? And then what are the new things that we want to roll into this process? So now I want to talk to you about the process the steering committee used to develop this plan that you have before you. So this plan is for 2018 to 2023 and should guide our work for the next five years. Uh, we begin with this review of the 2013 to 17 plan. Uh, we used Dr. Dar Larry Coble. Uh, Larry has been in this room before and um, is a longtime former superintendent in the state of North Carolina. He served as our executive director of the Piedmont Triad Education Consortium for seven years. <laughs> And Larry's been through a number of strategic planning processes with other districts. And he helped to sit down with us as staff and guide our work in getting the proper input from the community and framing our conversation. So our steering committee first met in March. They met again in April. And then we broke into action planning teams to develop action strategies 
and action plans for each of the strategies and goals that were adopted by the Strategic Planning Steering Committee. So this is where we landed with our new vision. If you'll take a moment just to read that. So those of you who have been through a process like this before know that you can spend a lot of time on vision and mission and determining what is it that we stand for. And the vision is, where do we want to be? What's the statement of where we want to be? What's the lofty goal that we want to be? And we want to be a safe and innovative learning environment where everybody is valued, respected, they're challenged. Uh, we have an engaging staff and engages students and engages the community. And we ensure that students learn, grow, create, and discover their talents through experiences that prepare them for success. And uh, that is, in essence, uh, the steering committee's consensus on our vision for the future. This next slide, our mission is short and something that you can remember. Our mission as a school district is we engage, equip, and empower students. I always say that if students aren't engaged by the teacher, they'll be engaged in something because I know all of us were in school. So it's our job to engage students, to equip them with tools and skills and help them to identify the skills and talents they have and develop them into uh, what we want to see them as they graduate and to empower them to make choices and decisions about their future. So our mission is to engage, equip, and empower, and you will see that again. The steering committee decided that these are our beliefs and our core values. We went through a process of identifying these, integrity, respect, dedication and commitment, relationships, and accountability. And rather than six priorities, we have narrowed it to four strategic priorities. Life-changing teaching and learning, highly effective educators and staff, enhanced educational environments, family, community, and business engagement, and our communications and relationships are melded into each of those four strategic priorities. So with that, um, you will now see the new logo for Davie County Schools that has come out of the strategic planning process. We have edited our logo to include our mission, which is to engage, equip, and empower. We'll start using that um, on our letterhead. The last slide is a few links that link to the data that was in this report. So now I want to focus your attention to the handout that you have on your table. And on the front of this handout, you'll see our mission, vision, beliefs, and core values, and our priority focus areas for 2018 to 23. And on the inside, you will see the high-level goals for each of those four priority focus areas. So I'm not going to read to you, but I would encourage you to look at these and know that underneath each of these goals, the action planning teams have developed specific strategies and action steps to accomplish these goals. Um, those have been passed back through the steering committee, and they will be tracked through our office on what progress we've made. Each of the strategies that have been identified by the action planning teams to accomplish these goals will have time, they have timelines established. They have groups of people who are responsible and we'll be tracking those over time to see what we have accomplished in meeting these goals um, as a district and as an organization. On the very back of this page is a list of all the people who were involved in this process, uh, the steering committee, the action planning teams that broke in and really dove into these specific goals and what would it take to accomplish those goals as an organization. So with that, Mr. Chairman, we present to you the 2018 to 23 strategic plan. I'd be glad to entertain any questions or comments from the board. I have a comment. I would just like to say that listening to all this and, and looking at what I've got in front of me, uh, a lot of people have done a great job in putting this thing together. Uh, I know from experience that you don't do this overnight, and, and so and the input, if I look at the objectives that are in here and the standards that they hope to uh, reach, I, I think those are outstanding. I think, it's, I think they're great goals. So I look forward to 
seeing us begin to process along these standards and see what it, it, it uh, provides for us. That's good. That is very good. Lots of hard work ahead. Absolutely. It was very much by accident that I spent about 45 minutes with Dr. Coble last night. We happened to be at a baseball game and one row across from each other. But one of the things that he pointed out was how um, impressed he was with the, the uh, leadership of the group uh, and how they worked together. And he just went on and on about uh, what a pleasure it was to serve. So I told him I'd be sure to share that with uh, Clint and Ms. Horn and you, of course, and others that in this room may have uh, participated in that. So getting a lot of compliments there. But well, definitely, you sit in a room uh, for a couple of days and see the, the amount of people that are in there. Um, it takes a lot of resources uh, to do it. Uh, we're doing a similar thing at work, and it's, man, you just want to get to work if you're not careful. But uh, it's like planning a trip, planning anything. You've got to figure out where you're going. Now we're figuring out how we're going to get there. So it's, it's, uh, it's a great thing, but it takes a lot. You know the questions, comments? A motion I have a second discussion you like me to come? I just wanted to say thank you to each person because I know I've been through this and it is it's great because you have to really look at yourself and you have to ask those questions and then to come up with answers within the community that to me is the icing on the cake that it really shows how committed not only the educational family is but our community family is and our support and I thank everyone for a job well done Any other questions, comments? All those in favor? Motion carries 6 0. Thank you for everyone for the hard work. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I'll, I'll just reflect as like you did, um, you know, when you call people to spend time together, never did we have problems with people committing the time to come and serve on our strategic planning committee. And I want to just say a big thank you to all the people in the community who took time out of their busy schedules to come and be a part of this important work. Next item on the agenda is a public address to the board. Ladies and gentlemen, we have no one to come to address us today, so we will have to wait till next month for that excitement. Perfect. Thank you very much. Uh, next item on the agenda is uh, staff reports, and we have uh, Michael Spielman coming to give us an update on the field house. Hang on just a second. Well, Chairman Junker, board, Dr. Hartness and staff, I I uh, want to give you a quick update on the Fieldhouse project. Um, there's been a lot of work that's went on in the last <clears throat> couple of months, because I didn't report last month, and, uh, but now rain has held us up quite a bit over the last couple of weeks. But as you can see, the brick, uh, the block, and, and everything is going up. Um, we're going to go by these pretty fast because it's just block. And, uh, but the crew's been out there very diligently. There's our sign from Walter Robbs. Um, scaffolding and everything is going up and uh, trusses are on site. The um, um, as you can see it start taking shape here. All the door jams been placed. Uh, steel's been set. They've been they've set the steel on the front, on the back half towards the school, and or front, however you're coming at it. But then they're, they've moved around today to set the steel on the field side, and the framing crew is on staff. They're on site, getting ready to set trusses. So the trusses should be going up pretty soon. And uh, the masons are finished with the block, all but some final cleanups and repairs and. Uh, a lot of 
finish work on the block. And uh, they have started laying the outer course of the brick at the very bottom. And I don't have any pictures of this because this was put together last week, but they have sprayed the installation on the outside of the block so it looks totally different now to ready to put the brick on the, uh, on the outside. And um, does anybody have any questions? We have one um, makeup air unit, energy recovery unit, kind of like we have over the field, over the gyms and the locker rooms. Fresh air in, locker room air out. Uh, we have three, uh, two mini splits, one for the coaches meeting room and then one for the training room. And then, um, like I said, everything else will just be off that makeup air unit, which it'll be gas, it'll be propane and mechanical, just like the school is. Sure. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's going to be mostly brick. And uh, yeah, and then you'll have two front foundations that are that are columns with some metal work. And second question, what's the square footage again? I'm seeing you tell me. 4,752, I think it's 5,200 or something like that, I think. I think it's right. How are, how are they, how they feel about their schedule? Well, the last schedule that I got, they were a couple of weeks behind. It's going to look like the end of September at this point. You know, that was the last one we got last week, I think. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Uh, next item on the agenda is a uh, motion to go into uh, closed session to preserve the attorney-client privilege pursuant to the North Carolina General Statutes listed on our agenda to discuss personnel matters protected by state law and to discuss student matters made confidential by generous general statutes and FERPA. I have a motion by Mr. Fuller. I have a second by Colonel Hills. All those in favor? We're now in closed session. If we miss you, thank you very much for being here.